This is from the ground up. I've always been fascinated by what drives our business leaders, and I want to know about the journey they've traveled. My guest is the chief executive of Wizir, Joseph Ferrati. Hi, Francine. Good to see you. Welcome to Bloomberg. No frills flying revolutionized air travel. Gone was the glamour, the luggage allowance, and the free food and drink. And in return, destinations were opened up to millions more people. Since co-founding the company in 2003, Varadi has taken Wizz Air to new heights, and the carrier was named Europe's most sustainable airline earlier this year. We all know the pandemic shattered the industry, and with recession possibly around the corner, new challenges lie ahead. Wizz Air has managed to keep its head above water, expanding across Europe, and now into areas in Asia. Despite staffing challenges and rising fuel prices, Passenger levels are on the increase, with the airline expecting record traffic this summer. So, what tough decisions lie ahead? What has he learned, and what can we learn from him? Joseph, thank you so much for joining us no, here. Thank you for inviting me. Bloomberg, you're one of the the, the most well-known entrepreneurs uh, for good, and sometimes also a bit of controversy mm -hmm. around you. How did it all start? Well, you know, I never thought I would be such entrepreneur, if you want to put it that way. I, uh, I went to uh, Procter & Gamble, great American company, uh, to get properly trained after being educated. And I thought I would be one of those kind of managers, um, lifelong uh, <laughs> in, in the business, uh, moving locations, etc. Yeah. But that all changed in, uh, in 2001. I got headhunted for Malay Hungarian Airlines, mm -hmm. uh, which at that time was seen like a really dysfunctional, <laughs> Um, socialist type of, um, of, 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 of company. Um, uh, but at the same time, it was very exciting because that posed all the challenges uh, you can take. And you started testing your own um, boundaries yeah. uh, and you were pushing the envelopes sometimes beyond uh, the comfort zone. And then. Uh, so this is revamping basically a failed airline. Yeah, right? That's how you cut absolutely. your teeth in this. But also, it kind of changed me completely because, you know, I, I used to be. Uh, within a big corporate, so when you presented your business card, 90% of the business was done. Um, but but here, I mean, you were alone. I mean, uh, there was nothing behind you because there was no really properly functioning uh, uh, business. So yes, I mean, it was a complete um, a rerun and a turnaround of a, of, of a business, moving from socialism to capitalism, if you want to put it that way. And and is this where you find out that you had? To, is there something called like the entrepreneur gene? Because a lot of people come on this program and say, "I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur at five years old." When yeah. did you realize? Uh, that's very interesting because someone was telling me, and 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 she mined a piece of paper which I wrote like at the age of nine. Yeah. Uh, and I said I wanted to be a an entrepreneur to make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so so something must have been in the genes. Uh, um, but I don't know whether that's wh what it is, but uh, I, I would still consider myself as a, as a trained manager with entrepreneurial spirit. And, and then you decide to basically found Wizz Air. How? So after a couple of years at, uh, at Malev, uh, there was a significant opportunity uh, presenting itself. I mean, let's not forget, 2003 is the year where the European Union confirmed uh, accession of 10 new countries into the uh, Union, Hungary being one of them, yeah. Czech Republic, Poland, etc. And that really created the opportunity because at that moment, the whole regulatory framework of the aviation industry changed from a regulated market to a domestic market. Uh, and I thought, well, I, you know, I was coming from the uh, legacy side of the, uh, the industry working for, uh, for Malay, and I thought that, well, I mean, those guys will never be able to compete mm. uh, given all these uh, dragging uh, issues. And uh, the Westerners, the new generation airlines, will not recognize the opportunity as quickly yeah. as they yeah. should. So there was this window of opportunity, and I thought, well, this is what I need but to jump through. Just, I, I mean, I have to say, out of all the industries, right, so you have the safety of passengers, you have to buy big planes, you have regulation, you have slots with various airports. I mean, the barrier to entry in the airline industry is huge. It is. I mean, you know, it requires operational complexities to be tackled. Uh, it requires a lot of regulatory hurdles uh, to deal with, and it requires a lot of capital to be raised, uh, to be honest, to fund you know, the liquidity needs of the, um, of, of the business. And uh, you have to be quite thoughtful how you are planning on that business, because you see that actually a number of airlines uh, gets created uh, time and time again. Yeah. I mean, just this year, Visa is going to move 55 million uh, people. I mean, this is almost like the size of the United Kingdom. I mean, that's how profoundly you are affecting people's life. What was your hardest year? So we started flying back in May 2004. Uh, and um, 
fairly quickly we had to realize that we were out of money. I mean, simply could, we couldn't raise capital at that time um, sufficient for running the, uh, the business and uh, indeed we were running out of money. So by the end of the year, actually we became technically bankrupt. And the hard part of it is actually recognizing that, yes, I mean, you might be taking the risk on yourself, but when you are taking the risk of, you know, another few hundreds of people, your responsibility is different because you cannot just think of yourself, you have to think of a lot of other people. Um, and I mean, that puts a lot of weight on you and a lot of distress uh, on you. But at the same time, you also learn how supportive people can be. So we had like a staff meeting when we were clearly out of the money and there was no confirmed uh, funding plan uh, for the, uh, the airline. And I told the guys that, look, I mean, you can leave the company and that's fine. I mean, you know, find another way to feed your family and, you know, do something for yourself. And everyone said that, no, you know, if you die, we're going to die together. And that, that gives you emotion, that gives you personal strengths. And I think it shapes your character. I know you've spoken, met, uh, socialized with a lot of entrepreneurs and founders. Is there a common thread? Is there a secret sauce to being good at what you do? I don't know. I mean, um, I mean, there are good entrepreneurs, less less so good entrepreneurs, and um, people are are quite different depending yeah. how they come into it. I mean, some people are incredibly creative. Some people are incredible risk takers. Uh, some people are pretty good at not only being inventive, but also being able to execute. I think I'm probably in that category, so I can invent, but I also can execute because that's just how I've been no. trained and how no. my uh, development has been happening uh, personally. But I, I mean, execution is hard, so do you have to measure when it works and when it doesn't? There is no way that everything is going to work out. Um, but kind of the way you can make an impact on the world and you, you can make a difference is that if you try out a number of things and, and maybe a very few of them uh, will actually manifest in success and the rest will fail. And there is a cultural difference in a way if you look at the United States. Uh, the United States is quite encouraging for entrepreneurship uh, and it's socially acceptable to fail. In Europe, uh, and maybe the UK is kind of in between, mm -hmm. uh, in Europe uh, failure is not a great thing, it's a shame. Uh, and Europe is a lot less entrepreneur uh, than the U.S. as a, as a result. But you say the U.K. is kind of in the middle. Why? I mean, there's a bit of shame, but also people are quite proud of being entrepreneurs. Yes, I mean, I, I think the U.K. is the flagship uh, in terms of capitalism. I mean, if you look at the functional financial market in Europe, yeah. I think it's a very London-driven uh, phenomenon. Uh, but uh, to some extent it's also affected by continental European behavior and yeah. standards and, and, and patterns. So yes, I think it's, it's, it's somewhere in between. Uh, Joseph, how do you build the team around you? I've, I've not always told this is the secret, actually, to being successful, even if you're a good entrepreneur. Um, you hire for attitude. I mean, that is this whole big debate in in corporations, you know, what are you really looking for when you, yeah. when you hire someone? I mean, do you um, uh, look for the talent? Uh, do you look for the, uh, the skills, the experience, or what? Uh, in my view, you have to hire for attitude. Uh, because if you are not totally stupid, uh, you're going to be acquiring the skills, you're going to be going through the experience curve, and you're going to be picking up things important to, uh, to, do a, to do a good job. But you cannot change attitude. Um, so that's a given and, uh, and you have to spot people with the right attitude and once you get that I think a lot can be achieved uh, with that. I, I know you um, landed in hot water or a bit of controversy for saying that actually a lot of the pilots had to go the extra mile because a lot of them were, were taking days off because they were tired. Yeah, but do, I, you I, do you remember that? I mean, did you regret what you said? Did you power through? Like, was that just a miscommunication? And how no, did you manage? No, it? no, 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 not not at all. I mean, I, I think what I was trying to describe was uh, uh, was kind of a way of looking at life as opposed to um, referring to actual situations. I mean, we are incredibly rigorous in the company uh, regarding fatigue management. I mean, we would never push anyone beyond. Uh, any any limits to get into danger zone or anything like that. I mean, uh, I think we are an exemplary uh, airline with, uh, with that regard. Mm -hmm. We have never had an incident um, um, resulting from this. We actually have never had any incident yeah. otherwise, a uh, serious one. Uh, no, I think this is a way of, 
of approaching life. I yeah. mean, um, you know, just mind that you know there are two two hundred people uh, on your plane, and those people yeah. want to travel, and they want to get to their their destination. And it, it, it doesn't mean that you have to stretch yourself yeah. beyond uh, um, kind of the, the, the possible lines. And by the way, this is a highly regulated industry. I mean, of you course. cannot really do yeah. crazy things anyway. But I, I want to ask you about your relationship with controversy. So a lot of the times, you know, founders say, "I can't say anything wrong because otherwise." you know, I'll, be, I'll have press articles on me and, and it will show a bad side. Another is saying, well, I'm human. Like, why can I not talk to the press or give interviews as I want to? Uh, I think I'm a kind of guy who says what, what I think. Uh, and uh, yes, that may be controversial. Am I right all the time? Certainly not. Um, um, and I make mistakes. Uh, but if, if I don't make mistakes, uh, I never really learn how far I can go and how, how good I am. Uh, at in, in certain things. So I think it's fine to speak up. I think it's fine to uh, make mistakes. It's fine to, you know, push your neck out. Uh, but yes, I mean, it comes with failures. It comes with, you know, some clefts here or there. So what's your industry going to look like in four years? This has been one of the most disrupted industries during COVID. Aviation, the airline industry itself, uh, I think is one of the most fascinating industries uh, you can uh, think of because of the complexities. Uh, because of the scale, because of the impact uh, you are you are making, um, I think this industry will continue to develop. Um, uh, mobility is inherent in mm -hmm. in people's need. Uh, there is demand. The challenge to the industry is how you do it in a way uh, that you are sustainable and you are friendly mm -hmm. to the environment. The industry needs to find a technology that decarbonizes the operation of uh, of airlines. I think we are on the way uh, to, uh, to achieve that. Uh, we actually have joined into initiatives um, uh, trying to explore uh, various uh, technological alternatives right. uh, for dec decarbonizing the, the industry. But we're, what, 10, 15 years away from those? This is 10, 15 years away, but in the meantime, you know, we are also looking at um, changing the, um, the fuel, um, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, to, to make sure that you know we, we are very responsible. Let's not forget, I mean, we are the airline flying the youngest fleet of aircraft uh, in a most efficient um, uh, manner. Uh, so that makes us already pretty green relative to the rest of the industry. But we are totally committed uh, for um, totally cleaning this yeah. up and making it um, purely green in the future. 30 years ago, it was a thing to travel, right? You had even cutlery that, that was like proper, everybody had a meal. Then we go more to low cost. What's it going to be like in, in five years? Is it low cost, but then expensive hotels? How will people tr travel and holiday differently? In my mind, um, the low cost sector is, is really commoditizing uh, the industry. Um, I mean, you don't travel for travel purposes. You uh, travel as a mean of achieving something when you are at no. your, your destination. And as a result, um, travel is, is a commodity. Uh, and low-cost airlines will win this. Uh, if you look at Europe already, I think half of the uh, passenger traffic intra-Europe has been already converted into, uh, into low-cost travel, and I, I think that trend will continue to, uh, to unfold uh, uh, going forward. And yes, I think you will try to maximize you know, your investment at the hotel and yeah. gastronomy, drinking better wines, yeah. and you know, all those sort of things. So yeah, how does that change, actually, how you'll manage with air? Is, is there like a dream destination or like air, you know airline um, route that you'd like that you don't have now we we try to understand you know what people want to do where they want to go so when we started with our 17 years ago uh, we felt we should be creating an infrastructure for people uh, who, who who are moving from east to west for work right. uh, so they take up a job in London from Poland and we need to move them. Right. If I look at our network today, we just launched the, uh, the Maldives. Uh, we are flying to um, Egyptian beach uh, destinations. Uh, we are flying to Spanish, French uh, beach destinations. So we go with the flow. And I think we try to better understand what people want, where they want to go. And we want to be in the forefront of, of that uh, last year. Joseph, you famously said, I think, in an interview that actually you don't have to be liked or you don't have to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm as a boss. Is that true? Like what, what motivates people to stay in your organization? Yeah. In, in my mind, I mean, uh, this is not a love story. Um, uh, being liked is, 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 is a lot less important than being respected. I think you need to be uh, respected. You also have to accept the fact that uh, if uh, you are really leading, 
uh, and you are trying to make a difference, that creates controversy as you, as you poke that. Yes, I mean, you're going to be uh, on uh, certain people's interest and you're going to be on certain people's counter interest. Mm. Uh, but otherwise, change will never happen. Uh, you know, affecting changes, um, executing changes, uh, never comes with walking on that carpet. Joseph, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.